So my name is Kathy, and you can find me at Asimsoka on Twitter and Instagram and everything. Um, I am joining you from San Francisco, California. Uh, from my home office, uh, my now full-time home office, I work at GitHub, which is headquartered here in San Francisco, but now at GitHub, we are entirely remote. And I've been working with remote teams for a, a little over five years. And before GitHub, I was at Heroku. Both of these companies are both uh, over 70% 70, 70 remote uh, in normal times. And now both of us are, um, are all of us are, 100% remote. And so we are, believe it or not, even though we know a lot about and we have been working with the remote teams for a while, we are uh, still learning a lot too. Um, so it's really exciting. And uh, I'm going to share some of those tips and some of the things that I've learned along the way, um, particularly for product managers and um, working across product management teams. So engineering, design, and product in general. So right now, I'm in San Francisco recording this, and um, when you're watching it, I will probably be waking up and drinking coffee, but feel free to please DM me um, on Twitter or wherever, or shoot me an email. I'll flash my contact info at the end of this talk, and I'll try to answer your questions, but I am going to be available um, at the Q&A, which I think is later this evening, um, and I'm really looking forward to meeting everyone and talking more with you about remote product management work. So, the number one thing about remote work that um, it is that it's all about collaboration, just like any regular kind of work. And this means that you're going to run into a lot of the same challenges that you would with in your regular day if you weren't doing remote teams. And I'm gonna talk, in this talk, I'm gonna show you some tools that are really helpful, but at the end of the day, it's really just about how you use them that really matter. And I found that these tools, they actually don't matter unless you're really thinking about the momentum around the work itself and the people driving that momentum. You could try to get everyone to use the same OKR tool, but if they're not updating it on a consistent basis, is it really that useful to you? Probably not. So instead of looking at the process, I rely on a lot of the people and the habits to help drive how I'm working with these remote teams. And uh, I'll talk about this a lot, about how this manifests throughout the tools and some of the updates that I, that are some of the recommendations that I have. But async is your friend. Asynchronous means, a, um, async means asynchronous. And, um, it's really what's going to be your powerhouse behind everything that you do in, in a remote team, whether it's documenting things in an async way, uh, communicating in an async way, thinking through ways where somebody else can come into the conversation or into the document after you have left and they can still contribute to that document or that conversation is, is going to be what drives the power of your remote team. And people, when we work on software, uh, we store a lot of information in our heads. You know, this is known a lot of what we're doing is knowledge work. Designers are holding patterns and trying to um, get them documented. And software engineers are trying to articulate these really complex problems and challenges into the right level of the code. Legal teams are managing these methodologies different work require, uh, risk requirements, legal translations, etc. And us as product managers, we are really participating as knowledge workers when we're doing things like writing spec, spec docs or updating planning documentation, doing business reviews, looking at metrics, uh, and really trying to understand the analytics. But at the end of the day, we are coordinators. And coordinators need to pull in a lot of information from various parts of the team, various parts of the business. So we are often the folks that are tapping somebody on the shoulder. But we can, and instead of that turning into us consistently being a jerk, but still turn, while we try to get our jobs done, we can leverage some of these async tools to help us reduce that feeling of interrupting somebody when they don't want to be interrupted. And what this means is it opens up and it puts more power in both people's hands as you, you're increasing that two-way communication. 
So I'm going to show you a lot of different tools today. And like I said, it's not about the tool or the process. It's actually about how you use it and how you empower your teams to use these things. So there are many different options for this. And one thing that one that we're looking at right now is Slack. And that's a chat tool, a chat based tool. You can do a lot of other things with it, like um, integrate with different uh, tools that you use to help drive your workflows or store your files and things like that. So, but there are many different uh, tools that do the exact same thing. Uh, so it's really, it's not about the tool at all. It's about how you use it. And just because this is how we're using it at GitHub doesn't mean you have to use Slack, but I do recommend some of the ways that we've been using it and some of the lessons that we've learned through that for sure. So I'm sure many of you are very aware of Slack, though you probably already do use it. And at GitHub, this is where we do the majority of our of our communications, probably. And I'm sure you do, too, with a lot of your teams. So one of but one of the things that I found that um, is not so great about all chat apps and Slack definitely suffers from this, or that at least the way we use it is it can be really discouraging for teams or it can um, it can kind of incite the wrong kinds of behaviors with a with a uh, chat application. So when we're thinking about our communications on this application and how we would go about doing that in a, for chat, uh, you have to think about, you know, how is it being received? How am I communicating this for this medium? And what's the purpose behind it? So it really is about being meaningful and mindful be, um, with all of your communications, even, even if it's really, really easy to just type something out in Slack. So what I like to do is think about, you know, public channels are often better than private DMs. What that means is when I have a question or a piece of information, I think public first and then private second. There's many different layers. So public first, do I have a place that's public that I can put this information? If the answer is no, it's usually it's a little bit more confidential or it's sensitive information. And then I need to put it into a private channel. Sometimes I need to default to a, D, a private direct message. But I start with public and then I work my, my way down. And what this does is it reinforces public conversations, which makes all of my communications that much more accessible to the broader team. This helps reduce the amount of secrets, the amount of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that happens when people aren't contributing to, to the communication, to the conversation. Slack is your water cooler. You need to treat it like such. It's, you need to think about how to democratize these conversations a lot more. And that's really what this means. It doesn't mean open up your conversations, open up all of your sensitive conversations and confidential ones, but be mindful and, and treat it in a very meaningful way. So digging into Slack, we do also use um, an integration. So I mentioned that Slack um, does a really good job kind of pulling in all of our other tools. One of them that, that I leverage on my team um, with, with various different teams that I work with is called GeekBot. So here, what you're looking at is a conversation that GeekBot, it's a, um, it's a, it's a bot, a robot that um, communicates and asks questions throughout the day um, or day to day or how, whatever cadence you want, you can program it to ask anything at, at any cadence. So what you're seeing here is Kate and Geekbot are having a conversation about a daily stand-up. And so this is probably Geekbot's asking Kate, Kate every single day the same three questions. And these are questions that are very much in line with, um, with Agile uh, stand-ups. The way, so that's really great. I use this, this is the default for GeekBot. I use this with a lot of the teams that I work with, um, my delivery teams to, uh, to manage our day to day. And one thing I do with my product managers is I actually have uh, structured GeekBot in a way to ask questions on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And uh, my product management team, we like to check in with each other, but we don't have to check in with each other every single day. But I like to uh, get a sense of what everybody's priorities are, uh, but in a way that is a little bit more human and I can repurpose some of this content in other ways. And so instead of 
of interrupting everybody uh, multiple times throughout the week to get the content that I need, I can get it at a structured time that's predictable to everyone. And in a, in a very, very similar way, week over week, I can get that information that allows me to then go and repurpose it for other things. So I'm going to share with you what my team style is for doing this on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Feel free to take any of this you want. And the structure is going to be the same. I won't read through all of these questions, but the structure is going to be the same um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So the first question we ask is a human one to remind ourselves that, you know, the person that you see on the other side of the screen is a living, breathing human, and you should treat them like a living, breathing human. And um, we all really like each other on the team. So we're, um, we like getting this information anyway. And then um, a little bit of a, what are you working on? question and follow that up with um, what did you achieve or a follow-up question on, uh, on, on status throughout the week. So here's our Monday questions and then our Wednesday questions and I'll move myself out of the way really fast. Um, so the human question and then we're ending it on, you know, are there any goals? That's kind of a check-in question. And then our Friday question, which is really about uh, retrospective and look back to um, what are the things that you accomplished this week? And then you can see I'm asking the team to add um, what their top moments are. And I'm, I'm telling them I will probably repurpose this. So I'm giving them a heads up that whatever they write in here could get repurposed. Don't write anything that you don't want me to uh, blab to the rest of the organization. Um, and then what's we're a learning company. So what's the, what's the thing you learned this week? And it can be anything. It can be something just in your regular life if you want. So uh, I work at GitHub and we uh, GitHub is inherently, it's a collaboration tool for asynchronous work. So we're pretty lucky that we are building the tool that will help us do our jobs better, especially now that we have gone 100% remote. But when it comes down to it, you know, it's like I said before with Slack and everything else, it's really about how you use GitHub that matters. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that is. I'm going to go off camera for a minute to make sure that you can see the entire slide here. So how, how we use it really matters kind of uh, just as much as the work that we're doing. And what I want you to walk away with here is this can apply to any kind of documentation that you're writing. Uh, and it can be on GitHub in a repository, or it can be in a folder uh, that you share on Google Docs or it can be in attachments in an email. You, um, what, what we're trying to reinforce here is be mindful of the noise that you may be creating. You don't think about remote work and all this text and all these documents and emails and everything producing noise, but it really is. And what it comes down, down to is you, uh, you only want to comment if you really do have something to say to the discussion. There are discussions that happen all over the place in email, etc. And comment if you have something meaningful to say. You also want to, this will help you avoid drive-by kind of drop-ins. Um, this is a lot when you're, when you're in leadership, people call it the, the swoop and poop. Um, and so it helps you avoid those. Those happen sometimes. Note them and apologize for them. And another way to help you avoid them is to provide context. It'll, that providing context and just thinking about what the context is will help you realize if you are about to do a swoop and poop or not. Um, and everything should have a URL. Everything at GitHub has a URL. We document everything um, and or we document a lot of things. And so what this helps us with is it gives us the ability to cross reference, which it reinforces this organic nature of collaboration, which can sometimes feel hard to achieve if your team is distributed and working remotely. And it further provides, you know, it gives us that opportunity to provide even more context by cross-referencing where conversations has, have happened in the past. And it preserves the idea for digging it up later. I can't tell you how many times I've been in, in conversations where somebody has an idea and it's something that we've already thought about. And this probably happens to some of you too, especially if it's your idea. It's, it's um, easy to know if it, if it has been thought about before or not. And so what's cool about this is it helps us um, bring up that idea later and then we can tap back into the great conversation that we had in the past about it. On the flip side, it helps us kind of put a pin in it and maybe move on from that conversation if it's not a high priority. All right. Hello again. 
Um, okay, so with all of this, what I'm really talking about um, is how we work at the end of the day. And I'm going to tell you, you know, we're talking a lot about documenting everything. I'm going to tell you to document how you document, how you work. Um, and we do this at GitHub on a couple of teams and more and more teams are starting to adopt this. And the reason is it's a really good signal for other teams for how to communicate with you as a team. Um, you know, when you're working on your team, you really gel, you're getting it, you're, you're working day to day. And if somebody comes in and communicates in a different way, it can be really disruptive. So why don't we help them communicate in the way that, that works for the team? And that can be even more inviting. It also sets the context for where certain conversations go, how, um, like if they should be in Slack or if they should be in a repository or Google Doc or an email. And this can be even more inviting for people. When you know what the rules are, it's easy to play. Okay, let's talk about Zoom. So Zoom is an amazing tool, but it is not always your friend when it comes to remote work. So let's talk a little bit about that. Look, okay, so there, here are all these smiling faces, stock image for Zoom. This is not my team at GitHub. Um, and right now, you know, at GitHub and a lot of companies and a lot of families, even my family was, was playing video games on Zoom the other night. It's amazing. It helps us cross this bridge from our syn synchronous natures of our offices to a more virtual experience. And, and a lot of people need to be able to do this right now. And what's amazing about a tool like Zoom is that it helps us get there faster and easier than we ever thought we ever imagined. And we've become very reliant on it. And that can be problematic when you start thinking about what stresses a virtual team out. And Zoom has kind of become one of those stressors for a lot of virtual teams because it means just a lot more meetings. So let me show you kind of what this looks like. This is my calendar and, and right now um, I'm, I'm in a meeting blocked off to record this session, but all of these meetings are, uh, some of them used to be synchronous, um, some of them weren't even on my calendar, uh, but now they are. What's happening is Zoom is kind of taking over my life. And um, I'm sure you're all kind of familiar with this day to day, but um, also with Zoom. You're, I'm, I'm going from meeting to meeting, and I call this actually Zoom roulette, where I don't even have time to get up from my desk. I, I only have time to just press the next button uh, and then go into my next Zoom. It's because I'm just, I'm packed uh, back to back all day long. And all of my colleagues are the same, and it makes it so it's actually very, very difficult for me to get in touch with people um, not only adding the remote element where I don't see them all the time and I have to be intentional about my communication but now everybody's in zoom meetings I don't get a bathroom break I don't get a coffee break a water break anything I'm just going from one to the next so we want to think through kind of what are some asynchronous tools and workflows that could help us kind of combat this in a more creative way. So you might be looking at Tuesday and thinking to yourself, but wait a minute, Kathy, you're not packed. You're totally or it looks like you're totally free on Tuesday. And this is very intentional. So we've noticed this phenomenon, the Zoom, Zoom roulette phenomenon at, um, at GitHub. And we've started to do things like canceling meetings that we don't think are actually necessary. And that's forced us to, to work in a much more remote way. Maybe putting, instead of checking in for a 14-person uh, status meeting, you can do that 14-person status meeting on a Geekbot or in a document and have everybody everybody write down what their statuses are instead of having one person who's the note taker write down while everybody dictates is kind of how you can think about it. Um, so on Tuesdays, another way to reinforce this message is that we uh, um, do not have meetings. It's heads down time. I do have some meetings on there. We're still kind of cleaning some things up. Um, but And also Tuesdays doesn't mean you can't talk to everybody, but this is reserved for ad hoc, pair programming, pairing, brainstorming, um, calling for five minutes here and there uh, conversations. 
So we can still have those async conversations, but we don't have scheduled or um, recurring meetings. And this means that we have a lot more time for that knowledge work that we're doing. And so it's a, it's a pleasant surprise when Tuesday rolls around and you realize you have time to get all the documentation and all the writing done and all the reading done as well. And uh, now this brings me back to Zoom. So I said Zoom, Zoom isn't always your friend. Sometimes it really is. And so you still, when you're working asynchronously and you're working in a remote style, you still need to, uh, you still need to look at each other. And it does help to use Zoom um, and use the various different tools that Zoom introduces. I was in a, um, a meeting with about 34 people and we were trying to brainstorm and we realized we could just use the Zoom breakout rooms. So we did that and we got a lot more work done uh, rather than kind of going around and everyone listening to every single little group. Um, we could work kind of asynchronously in our synchronous meeting. It was fantastic. Um, and we do a lot of screen sharing over Zoom, that kind of thing, especially for brainstorming and pairing. It really helps um, you be able to have a conversation in real time, but then we will share screens and use things like Google Docs or Whimsical or look through uh, SQL queries and our SQL editor, things like that will help you kind of spitball some of your ideas. Feedback is another really great place to use Zoom instead of over email or over Slack. Feedback uh, come, can, you know, we always encourage people to give feedback early and often. And a lot of times just a small Zoom meeting where you can say like, hey, can you jump on the Zoom and it's Slack. If you have the, the integration hooked up, you can just say slash Zoom and it'll work. And you can jump on and quickly just share what your feedback is. You know, hey, it would really would have helped me if you communicated that in a different way. Um, or is everything okay with you? Whoops. Um, is everything okay? Do you need help? That kind of thing. And then lastly, you know, uh, we are faces on the other side of a screen. We are, it looks like we're made up of pixels, but they're, they're, we're real humans and real team members on the other side. So it is really important now more than ever to check in with each other and on the product management team, especially because we are busy checking in with all of our, all of the engineers and all of the other teams that we work with. It's really important for us to keep checking in with each other. Uh, seeing how other product managers are work, doing the small talk, but but also sharing and swapping ideas. And one other, one other thing I'll add for brainstorming, particularly for product managers, we talk about pairing and pair programming a lot. And I've found that because we're not in the same space anymore, Product managers uh, still, you still have to work through some really heady concepts and it can be very important for you to um, do that in um, with, with another product manager. And so I actually encourage pair time for my product managers um, and this helps me a lot just to like hash through some ideas. And uh, there's a lot that, there's a lot of different um, whiteboarding tools that you can use. I mentioned Whimsical is one of them. There's, you can also, if you have an iPad, you can hook up your iPad to join the Zoom and you can start to draw. Um, Google presentations and slides, you can actually open up a Google slide deck and start drawing within a slide. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this, but um, it's really important to get the ideas out. Sometimes you just gotta have somebody to, to work through it with you. So I encourage that a lot on my teams too. So last, um, I will uh, end on, you know, you when you're working asynchronously, especially as a PM where you're kind of, sometimes it can feel like you're a robot um, asking for statuses or uh, asking for metrics and that kind of thing, overcorrect on tone. People always tell me that uh, written communication is really hard because it's too difficult to get your tone across in text. And I just, think that's really silly. Uh, the internet is full of animated GIFs, emojis. You can use videos to, to help tell your story. Use them. Be mindful of your words for sure, but use your emojis um, to, and they'll help you get through. There's a reason they exist and there's a reason why they incite all kinds of different um, emotions for us. It's because they help 
convey the emotion. So uh, we'll even use emojis in our documentation. Um, another thing that's helped me uh, with documentation is Grammarly. It helps me um, make sure and feel more confident in my in my uh, in my docs that I'm sharing. Uh, so I recommend getting that too. There's a Chrome extension uh, for Grammarly. It just helps spell check and grammar check and tone check everything. There's a little they use like a smiley face, a straight face or a business face if you're depending on how it predicts your tone in your doc it's pretty useful. But I think tone is really how you interpret somebody else's communications. That's how we think about it. Um, but uh, a lot of this is how you know people are interpreting our, or we think about like emojis and, and how we express our own emotions. But a lot of this is um, also how we interpret somebody else's emotions is kind of how we think about tone. And uh, and. We really want to make sure that we're thinking about and treating people like intel like intelligent people. And if we treat people as if they're intelligent, then what you'll do is you'll do a better job at evaluating their arguments and treating them like a human at the end of the day. And this is a very this is a terrible. This is actually called the principle of charity, and it's um, all about thinking about uh, how and where the other person might be coming from before you act on it. And a really solid rule to live by here is you're human, be a human. And something that a colleague of mine says all the time, infect with joy. So thank you so much for letting me come and talk to you. Here, I'll move my video around one more time. Um, and there's my contact information. Uh, if you feel free to reach out over email, um, or like I said, on Twitter, and I'm Simsoka on GitHub as well, so you can find me and see kind of like all the different things that I'm doing there. Um, I do have a couple of different um, templates uh, to work with for product opportunities and product ideas that can be really helpful in just getting your ideas out and getting them shared in a documented way and getting started. So you can find those on, um, on my GitHub account. Uh, and thank you so much. And I hope to talk with some more of you later today. I'm really looking forward to it and really looking forward to hearing your questions and everything. Thank you, everybody. Bye.